All right, everyone, welcome. Let's, let's get going. For people just coming in, why don't you wait to sign in till the end or use the, the QR code to sign in. So welcome back to the Executive Lecture Series. Today we have a different bit of executive with us. Uh, Mark is alum, um, has a lot of connections to E-Town, a lawyer, a politician. Um, so we're trying to bring diversity of different leaders, diversity of different experience. Um, but I let him take uh, tell you more about his path, and and hopefully we all can learn from it. Uh, so treat him nicely, and um, let him tell you whether it's gonna you're gonna take questions during the. Oh, I'll take you can do during yes. or after. It doesn't matter. So yeah, so if you guys have stuff that comes up, and and uh, let's make it a conversation, and uh, um, let's welcome Mark. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Uh, hopefully I give you some insight uh, into maybe a career path or how to adjust to your career path. That's my goal, hopefully. Um, before I just get started, I'm going to set down my cell phone and my iPad and the gift you guys gave me. I'm going to give it to my wife over here because uh, these things are really a benefit, but they're really a detriment. I pity you guys. Uh, your social media and what it does to you and how it impacts you is, is just horrendous. Um, I never would have been elected to a public office, by the way, if that stuff existed when I was a kid. Trust me. Because um, uh, what you guys have to deal with and the bullying and the intolerance and the anger and the, the attacks you get from social media is just, it's a shame because that's not what life's supposed to be like. But you guys have to learn how to deal with that. Okay? So, um, as he said, I'm, I'm Mark McNaughton. I appreciate you guys having me here. Um, I am a graduate of Elizabethtown College back in 1985. Uh, my father is a graduate of Elizabethtown College. My daughter is a graduate of Elizabethtown College. Uh, she majored in poli sci and I made her go to law school. Um, so she's a practicing attorney in Harrisburg. Uh, that's what she does. So let me see. So rules for success. Let's start with them. So I'll give you a couple of ideas of what I used and what I have to use in my place of business. I'm a builder and we'll get to that. And I was a politician and we'll get to that. And I'm a father and we'll get to that. So uh, rules for success. I think for one of the rules you need and is that you need a strong foundation of who you are. You need to know what you believe and you need to be able to convey that to other people to get them to follow you. Okay. I also think you need the ability to have a vision and convey that vision clearly. You need to have long and short-term goals. Okay, one of my goals, was, I'm gonna tell you, was back in high school, is when I told friends of mine that I was going to be in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. And I was. You need to have a deep passion for what you do. Something that makes you get out of bed every morning and go to work. I love being a builder. Now, possibly I love being a builder because I have really bad ADD. And you guys are going to notice that. When I was a young kid, I had ADD. I was always in trouble in school. Always. Couldn't focus. Always in trouble. I was always in the hall. The principal and I were on a first name basis because I had ADD. Back then, they called it ADP, a discipline problem. Okay. Today, you guys call it ADD. When we didn't have any medications or anything like that, we weren't diagnosed with it. You just learned to deal with it. You can use it as an asset for what you do in life. For me, it's a tremendous asset. I'm a builder and I multitask all the time. And I think it helps me multitask really well. And as a politician, you multitask all the time and it was a tremendous asset. So don't look at it as a disability, look at it as an asset. We'll talk about that. You need the ability to face adversity and overcome it. And I'm gonna share a personal story about adversity with you. And hopefully I won't cry. But crying's okay, by the way. Just don't get, don't get wrong. Just because you're a man doesn't mean you can't cry. Just because you're an older woman doesn't mean you can't cry. Okay, emotions are a good thing. Use them to your benefit. You need a willingness to constantly be learning. Okay? Constantly be learning. I, I do it all the time. I study the economy all the time. Because as a builder, right now, we are in a recession. And as a builder, we are in a really bad recession. And I've been through four of them. 
four of them, 1981, 1991, 2007, and now this one, okay? History does repeat itself, pay attention to history. Because when the recession hits, you need to plan for that. So I'm now planning because of what I've learned for the past three recessions that I've been through. And for me, the last one that you need is a strong faith in God. That's very important to me. I lost it and I got it back. But I start every day on a bended knee and reading a Bible verse for a reason. Okay, so let's get going about who I am. So, no, I'm a graduate from Elizabethtown College, graduated in 1985. I'm a fiscal and social conservative. I actually would call myself more of a libertarian, but in Pennsylvania, if you're a libertarian, they think you're a nut. So you can't be a libertarian in Pennsylvania because there is no party for libertarians. It's a two-party system in Pennsylvania. If you want to be an elected official in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you either have to be a Republican or a Democrat. You'll lose as an independent and you'll lose as a libertarian. Do we have any poli-sci majors here? Anybody from poli-sci by any chance? Are you? Okay. But you will lose in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania unless you're a Republican or a Democrat. I was a Republican. I lived in central Pennsylvania. Uh, I was socially and fiscally conservative because my parents were. Central Pennsylvania is that way. You guys are in Lancaster County. You should probably understand that you are like in the hotbed of conservatism when it comes to politics. Okay. Um, see, what else about myself that I could share with you? Um, I have a strong belief that uh, the least amount of government is the best amount of government. That's uh, one of my core beliefs that I shared when I ran for office. And I'm extremely pro-life. Now, when you hear the words pro-life, some of you might cringe as to what pro-life is. I'm pro-life in a different definition than what you have been trained to think pro-life is. And I'll explain to you uh, the difference. And I think by the time we're done, you're probably going to say, boy, I'm kind of pro-life. You're probably going to say that to yourself because pro-life does not necessarily have always to do with the life of a child. Okay. So I, I started my career here at Elizabethtown College. I was a resident assistant. Marty Thomas Brume, some of you guys might know him. You know, he's a tall guy, walks around campus, has a beard, he's like six, seven. He used to be a really good basketball player. In fact, we played against him when we were in intramurals. Marty Thomas Brume was the director of student housing, right, Marty? That was, he was the director of student housing when I was an RA here at Elizabethtown College. I lived in Ober B1 for my sophomore, my freshman year. I was lucky enough to apply for and be selected to be one of the RAs on campus. And those guys chose to give me Ober B3, which was like an animal house hall. So for two years on Ober B3, I was a resident assistant here. And what a great job I, it was. I had learned leadership skills. I had to do hall planning to take you guys on different trips. We had to do two hall projects a, a semester. So I had to plan the hall projects. I had to work with food services here because we always did a camping trip in the fall and in the spring, we'd go away for a weekend. We had 42 men on my hall. Trying to get food for 42 men in your station wagon for a weekend it was a feat, let me tell you. Um, but it, that's what we would do. Uh, so I was an RA here. Uh, it it was, gave me wonderful, wonderful leadership skills. We started our first semester with 42 men when I was a sophomore. We started our second semester with 26. As an RA, sometimes you have to make tough decisions. You have to be a disciplinarian, but you have to be fair. But you need to learn how to do that. And that's what you're going to need to learn how to do in business. Uh, you need to be firm, but fair. Uh, my guys were out of control. I was on a first name basis with Dean Shaw. <laughs> uh, I was on the first name basis with Marty. Uh, and I was on the first name basis with the President Ebersol. But it taught me how to communicate with authority and people in authority and how to use their powers that they gave to you because they give you a lot of power as an RA here at Elizabethtown College. I don't know if that's the same way in other schools, but here RAs have a lot of authority at Elizabethtown. At least they did when I attended Elizabethtown College. And we were like, I was like one of 14 on campus at that time. Because back then, you ready? We had Meyer, Slosher, Royer, Brinzer, Ober. 
Am I missing any? I think that's it, right? Founders. Yeah, we had Founders Lounge. That's what I'm missing, Founders. Those were the only student housing we had. And then you had the three off-campus houses, Rose Garden, and there was uh, two others that were down there across the street, I believe, from Royer or Slosher. Um, in fact, I lived in Rose Garden my senior year. Um, I lived there for a semester, and then I commuted from home for a semester because I planned my education really well when I went to Elizabeth at Town College. I uh, First, I took summer classes every, every year. I took uh, 18 credits a semester, and then I took summer classes. So my last semester at E-Town, I had nine credits, three gyms, one pass-fail. It was a rough semester, let me tell you. It was very blurry. I can't remember all of it, but uh, I spent a lot of time downtown. <laughs> There's a couple of places I frequented. Um, but yeah, so that was my senior year at Elizabethtown College. But being an RA was actually a, a tremendous, tremendous opportunity to learn leadership skills that I put into practice every day in my business. So I'm a builder by profession. I was a builder and started in 19... 85 and until 1996 i was in the building profession and uh, those leadership skills being a builder you know i work with 150 200 subcontractors um, a day instructing them on plumbing electricals i do a schedule that's 111 days long for each one of my houses that i build i'm currently building 55 houses each one of them with a different 111 day schedule so multitasking and my ADD really is helpful, okay? Really helpful. Um, I decided in 1996 that I wanted to run for office. Now in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, if uh, an opportunity presents itself to run for office and that's something you have a deep passion and desire to do, then you make sure you pick a time when somebody is leaving office. So when somebody's retiring, or there was a special election, God forbid somebody passes away in office and the seat becomes available and you can run for it. That's the time you wanna run because incumbency in Pennsylvania, well really incumbency anywhere anymore is very strong. So you can't beat a sitting incumbent. They always have the money. They always have the name recognition. They always have everything in their favor. So I had an opportunity to run in 1996. I always wanted to be a member of the General Assembly. So I decided to run for office in 1996. I do, you do a poll before you run. Now keep in mind, I've been a builder in Pennsylvania in my area where I'm running for office for almost 12 years. I've spent millions of dollars getting my name out there. McNaughton Homes, McNaughton Homes, McNaughton Homes, McNaughton Homes. Millions of dollars I spent getting my name out there. So I thought, man, I'm gonna run for office. This is gonna be a piece of cake. I'm gonna walk into the seat, no problem whatsoever. My name ID is gonna be off the charts. I get hundreds of people supporting me they're all rallying to my cause. Run, Mark, run, Mark, run, Mark. Okay, you know, you get these rah-rahs going, they, they puff you up, your ego gets involved. You gotta have a really big ego to run for office too, by the way. Um, so your ego gets involved and you puff yourself up and you get these hundreds of supporters all excited and you do a poll and it comes back and your name recognition is 3%. That was my name recognition, 3%. Now, I got hundreds of people telling me I need to run for office, and they all believe in what I can convey to them that I'm going to do when I get in office, how I'm going to help people, how I'm going to rein in the spending of government, how I'm going to do all these wonderful, lavish things getting to office, and my name recognition is 3%. And I'm 60 days away from Election Day. Think about that one. So I tested my opponent's name recognition, he was at 55%, 55%, 60 days from election. Of course, I can't disappoint these people, right? I can't disappoint myself. Can't believe that I, I can't do this. I can't believe that I'm gonna fail. But boy, when you're looking at numbers like that, you're gonna fail. <laughs> I mean, you're gonna fail. But I committed to these people that I would do it. Now I'm going to do it. And we did. I worked seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. You want to you want to do be successful? I don't care which 14 or 16 hours a day you select. Just work them. 
I don't care which ones they are, but just make sure you work them. Because you're not going to be successful by not putting in the time and the effort. Not what you will need to do. And I'm going to suggest to you that if all you're doing is chasing the dollar, you will never be successful. In personal life and professional life, if all you do is chase the dollar, you will not be successful. Not like I'm going to define success. So I started to run for office seven days a week. I figured out in my legislative district, there were certain times you could not knock on doors. Wednesday evening was taboo knocking on doors in a certain part of my district because everybody went to church. The Jewish community that was in my legislative district, I could not knock on doors Friday night into Saturday evening because I had to understand that's their Sabbath. I'm not knocking on doors sundown on Friday in the Jewish community areas because I had to figure that out. You know, you have to understand who your audience is if you want to be able to be successful. One way to turn them off is to disturb one of their, one of their functions. And that's, that's a religious thing. Don't, it's not something you want to mess with because that would definitely not get you their support. I worked, my supporters worked, we knocked on doors. We knocked on over 13,000 doors. And I say we because we had an army of people who would knock on doors with me. That's how many people believed in what we were trying to accomplish. Election day rolls around. We even demoralized our opponent even more. I have to laugh about these things too. You gotta be able to laugh in life too. So, so my opponent was, was just, my poll numbers just kept growing and growing and growing and his number was stagnant. And he was just couldn't help himself. He just couldn't get himself out of the stagnant number. And my name recognition kept rising and my poll numbers kept rising. Two days before election, I did a poll and I crossed. Two days. Two days before election, I crossed him over. So I took the lead two days before the election. So we really wanted to, to take this victory home. So we had our poll, walk, we had every poll watched in my legislative district. My legislative district consisted of 29 of the 47 municipalities in Dauphin County. Okay, so I was a very vast area that I had to cover. Some areas I had more cows than people. Uh, just happened to be that way, but that was my legislative district. So on election day, we all our poll work, workers, we started in the, early in the morning. We gave them hand warmers because it was November and it was cold. So we gave them all hand warmers, like packs of hand warmers. So they're standing at the polling places and they're not freezing. I mean, you're you're in, you know, you're not in these shoes, but you're in shoes that these kind of those kind of soles because you're standing there looking nice, and uh, you're freezing. So my opponent's people didn't have hand warmers but our, all our people did, so all our people were warm. We brought them breakfast. Our opponent's people didn't get breakfast. We brought them lunch. Our opponent's people didn't get lunch. We brought them dinner. By dinner time, our opponent's people were like, screw this, we're leaving. We, don't, we didn't get fed breakfast, we didn't get fed lunch, we're not getting fed dinner, we're not gonna work the polls. So they left before the polls closed. And we ended up getting 55% of the vote. On that, on that election. I ran for election five different times. I won five times in a row, so I'm undefeated. I've served my time, 10 years, 10 years of hard time. My wife works at the legislature now, and she's worked there for 14 years, and uh, she'll tell you that things are different now. It's too much polarization. Today, I could not be an elected official. I govern from the middle. I believe compromise is not a bad word. I believe getting half a loaf is better than getting none. And in legislature, if you can get half a loaf, buddy, you, you just had a feast. Because usually you get like a slice of bread. If you're trying to accomplish something, usually you get a slice of bread. And the wheels of government move very slow. So if you're not dedicated to your cause, I don't care if you're in business or if you're in government, if you're not dedicated to your cause, find some cause you can be dedicated to because you are not gonna get your legislation done in the legislature when you first introduce it. I introduced a bill for homeschool kids so they could participate in extracurricular activities. How hard is that? That's, that sounds like a no brainer, right? Let homeschool kids participate in extracurricular activities at their public school. Come on, how hard is that? Well, three terms later, six years in, I turned it over to, uh, friend of mine, Bob Godshaw, to introduce, because he, he had more time in the legislature, so he had more respect from the other legislators. But I argued it on the House floor. 
and I argued it from a discrimination standpoint. Because I said it was discriminatory to not let these kids participate in extracurricular activity. We don't, let them, we don't want discrimination anywhere else. Why would we discriminate then against homeschool kids? That was my argument. And uh, I had the, the Philadelphia Black Caucus chairperson come walking over to me. His name was Thomas, big, burly guy. And uh, he came walking over to me and he said, you know what, the Black Caucus of Philadelphia is gonna support you because we don't like discrimination either. The bill passed. Homeschool kids now can participate in extracurricular activities. But it took me six years. So tremendous victory, but use what you got, okay? Just make sure you, you can convey clearly your argument. If I couldn't have conveyed that argument on discrimination clearly to those people to get them to understand, to follow it, I would have failed. Failure is not a bad thing. All you do is pick yourself up and go forward. But if you don't want to fail, then you don't try, you won't succeed. Okay? Success is a lot of trying and failing and getting back up and trying again. Now, don't try the same thing because the definition of mental illness is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. You are not, so don't do it over and over and over again. Adapt, change, find a way to accomplish your objective differently. Maybe you have the wrong objective. You got to re so refocus. Maybe you have the wrong objective. Your objective might be a shorter one, or it might need to be a longer one. But you need to reevaluate and take a look. If you have the wrong objective, you'll never get the right answer. Oh, remember I said you gotta continue to learn too? I was in the legislature. First thing they did is put me in class. <laughs> I had to take a class on how to be a legislator. I had to learn the rules of the House of Representatives. I had to learn decorum. House of Representatives, you have to wear a tie. You must speak with a jacket on when you go to the microphone. You cannot do, you can't go to the microphone and make an argument without being in proper attire. Okay? You had to learn how to speak to other representatives. You cannot use a name on the House floor. You have to say the gentleman from Philadelphia or the gentlewoman from Scranton, or you cannot use the name of the individual who you're referencing. If you do, you get admonished by the Speaker of the House. I was admonished, admonished one time. That like, guy from Philadelphia really upset me. Uh, so I had to go up and sit next to the Speaker in the, in the punishment chair. That's not a, you don't want to go up and sit next to the speaker in the punishment chair. You got 203 members in the House of Representatives. Now there's 202 looking at you like, you know, you're sitting in the punishment chair. That's not, that's not where you want to be is in the punishment chair. But, so I had to learn how to do, uh, speak on the House floor. I had to learn how to speak to the senators in, in the, in the Senate. I had to learn how to speak to the administration staff. And if you don't treat people fairly and correctly and with respect, especially staff, and I mean staff, I mean like a waiter and a waitress. I'm talking about people who should and deserve respect. If you don't treat them with respect, especially the staff, I don't care where you go, you're gonna fail miserably because they know much more than the elected official in politics. And sometimes they know much more of how an operation works in business you know, they know a lot more. I multitask. I can guarantee you my staff, I have, I have professionals on my staff that know a heck of a lot more about what they're doing in their position than I do. I just know how to manage them. I know how to get the best out of them. I know what motivates them. But if you don't treat your staff, if you don't treat the staff correctly, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to get anything done. And I don't care who it is. And the if you're in a, if, you're, if it's a waiter or a waitress, be very careful because they handle your food. Just, just saying, be really careful because they handle your food. And then when I was in the legislature, I attended law school. So I, have a, I had a midlife crisis at the age of 37. So, 
my wife says to me, you know, at the age of 37, you decide to go to law school. And everybody else has a midlife crisis, they buy a Harley. But not you, you go to law school. So go figure, right? right? That's because I'm a complicated kind of guy. She says I'm simple, but I, think, I don't think she means it as a compliment. I just, I'm just saying, I don't think that's a compliment from her. But it could be, but I, I doubt it. So I decided to attend law school at the age of 37. Um, that's where I met my current wife. Um, at the age of 37, we went to law school together. We did it at night. I worked all day and I went to night school, five to 10 o'clock, four days a week, going to night school, four years in a row. Except we tried to, to uh, make it only three years of pain. So we went summer school, five days a week. So that's how we got through law school in three years instead of four. And I took a semester off to run for office because my opponents, one of my opponents' uh, staff were in, in my law school and they reported me to the dean for not attending enough classes. So I could have been kicked out of law school. So I had to take a semester off. So I wouldn't miss too many classes. Yeah, yeah I, I did figure out how many you were allowed to miss each semester of each class though. Like it was like 2.3 of one class, it was 1.9 of another class just so I could keep my hours because I was in the legislature at the time and I had to be on the House floor for votes. And sometimes I was on the House floor from, oh, I don't know, five o'clock at night until nine o'clock the next day. That's just the way they work. They don't work on normal business hours in the legislature. They will, they're odd, their hours are really odd. <clears throat> now they're even worse because you don't get weekends off. You don't get summers off. When I was there, I used to get summers off. I pity them now. Now they don't get summers off. You're supposed to have the budget by June 30th. They work until September, October, November, and the staff has to stay there. They don't get any time off. The quality of life is really bad, so for the for, for staff members and for members now in the legislature. But I went to law school, and um, in law school, I was challenged by everyone there because I was a conservative, and most of the students were 20-somethings out of college, and they had a different view of the world than I did. And um, so we were in law school, and we had a class, uh, constitutional law. I'll tell you, I'm a strict constitutionalist, too, when it comes to uh, the Constitution of the United States. And I think that helped me in the legislature because I knew I was a strict constitutionalist. So the Constitution says what it says, and it doesn't say what it doesn't say. It's, it's really black and white. It's not a living document. It's not a breathing document. I think it's a static document, and I think it's inspired by God because the guys that wrote it were brilliant, that it that it's stood the test of time for over 200 years. They were absolutely brilliant how they could foresee all that they saw about how to run a representative republic. And we have a representative republic. We don't have a democracy. Democracy is mob rule, it's rule of the majority, and the beauty of our government is it's not rule of the majority, it's a representative republic. So everybody who says democracy, I just cringe when I hear that word, that's, that's a bad, that to me is not at all what we have as a form of government. But I'm a strict constitutionalist, and when I was in the legislature, uh, I had a class by Professor Witte, and uh, Marshall was in this class with me, matter of fact. Um, we, we didn't get along at first in law school. She was a liberal, I was a conservative, it just didn't work. And uh, so we were, uh, we were in this constitutional law class and my professor says, uh, we're, do we're debating Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Everybody knows I'm pro-life, right? I explained that to you here. So I raised my hand to answer the question and Professor Whitty says, oh no, no, Mr. McNaughton, we have something special for you at the end of class. Now it's just like five minutes in, five minutes into an hour and a half class and, and Mr. McNaughton gets something special. So we get to the end of class and Professor Whitty says, looks at me and he goes, so Mr. McNaughton, what do you think the role, the proper role of government is? Because we just debated Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And so I'm sitting there and I said, well, that's easy, Professor. The proper role of government is to uh, help those who can least afford to help themselves. And it's to protect those who can least protect themselves. Could have heard a pin drop in the room because everybody thought I was going to come off with this thing about pro-life, and that's not at all. That's not the role of government. It may be a small portion of a role of government. That's not the role of government. It's to help people. It's to protect those who can least afford to protect themselves. It's to give people dignity. It's to help them survive. That's what I mean by pro-life. Okay? It's not always about the child. It's 
It's survival. It's helping them out of a bad situation. It's giving them a hand up so that they can go and do those things that they want to do. That's, that was the role of government. It wasn't at all about the case we just debated, which is now moot anyway, but it wasn't about the case that we just debated. And uh, it was funny because in law school, they teach you this word called penumbrums. Do you ever hear the word penumbra? You ever hear that word, penumbra? It, I know, it, here, let me tell you what a penumbra is, real brief, because I don't believe in penumbras either. I mean, my wife talks to me all the time and she doesn't say something, but she tells me it's in the penumbra, I don't know. The penumbra is this like gray area that even though it's not there, it's actually there. So even though it doesn't say it, it's just understood to be in there, okay? Penumbra, okay? So, but just, so if you're trying to explain something to someone and, and you don't get all of it in the explanation, just tell them, well, it's in the penumbra. It's, 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 it's there, okay? It's, it's, I think it's a made up word by judges because judges sometimes don't wanna to make tough decisions. So they just say, well, it's, it's, it's in the decision somewhere. It's in the penumbra of the decision. Okay, yeah, okay, it's in the penumbra. Just, so everything that goes on in our house is in the penumbra. That's, that's where I find it, I guess. I don't know. Um, but uh, I don't have an affinity for lawyers. I never did. I, don't, I think that uh, lawyers in business uh, try to make things more difficult. They make it hard to, make, to come to a compromise. They make it hard to have a resolution. And frankly, most of them, when you ask them a question, the answer is, well, not necessarily. <laughs> it's hard to come to a resolution when the answer is not necessarily. Okay, it's never black and white. It's always not necessarily. Uh, so I didn't, I don't have an affinity for lawyers. Most of my lawyer friends don't like lawyers. Um, our house is really quiet because my wife and I are both lawyers. We don't, don't talk too much. It's pretty quiet at our house. The dogs get most of the attention, that kind of stuff. But, uh, but yeah, so just, um, if you do want to be a lawyer, I think it's a great profession, but be a lawyer that solves problems. Okay, be a lawyer that helps your clients to the right answer. Don't be the lawyer that racks up legal fees. Be the lawyer that helps to resolve and resolve fairly. Because if one party wins and the other party loses in a negotiation, that is not going to help you succeed. You cannot negotiate in good faith and be, I win, I win, I win. That's not success. You may think that's success until that person, you need that person's assistance sometime in the future, and all they remember is, I win, I win, I win. You're not going to enlist that kind of success. You're not going to, you're not going to enlist, enlist their support to help you if you are not willing to compromise. Okay? So you need to be able to compromise, especially if you're in business or if you really need to compromise when you're in politics. So when I was in uh, 1997, uh, my son died. He was four. This is where it gets hard. I was married, and uh, it was my third child. His name was Christian. We had a great daughter. Her name was Megan. You heard about her. She went to school here. I had a son, Mark Jr., who also has really bad ADD, and he is an ER doctor, so it fits his profession really well. Because he is constantly running, constantly diagnosing different things, really bright kid, definitely didn't get it from me, um, but a really good kid. So my third child, Christian, uh, my wife at the time, wanted to surprise me with the sex of the baby because we already had a boy and a girl. So she went to the doctor and uh, the doctor told her to call her husband. So I ran down to the hospital, he stuck me in a room, no windows, dark, just a stark room, just painted walls, no pictures, no nothing. And the doctor came in and said, listen, your son doesn't have a brain can't see it got a strong heartbeat though so it didn't make any sense because he didn't have a brain why would he have a strong heartbeat 
It was May 7th. I'll never forget it. It's my birthday, by the way, 1993. And he said, you know, this child, if, it, if, it, if you have the child, it's going to die on, at birth. Um, if you have the child that lives, it's going to have spina bifida. It probably will not be able to drink, eat, talk, or breathe without assistance. You should probably not have the child. That's what we're going to tell you. So that's what they told me. We decided against that. So we did our research. We found a doctor in Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, Dr. Donna Chop. Uh, his name was Dr. Shute. He invented the uh, he invented the device called a shunt. Um, my son had water on the brain. He had hydrocephalus. Is the name of the uh, the condition he had hydrocephalus. And Dr. Shute had mentioned saw kids with hydrocephalus, and he installs this little device called a shunt. It's a little tube. It's almost the size of a inside of a big pen, and it goes into your brain and it allows you to take the fluid from your brain into your abdomen and you discharge it as waste. Okay, it's a really cool life-saving device. There's thousands, tens of thousands of people in the world walking around with shunts that work perfectly fine. Christians malfunctioned. Um, so every week we drove to CHOP, every week, to have a battery of tests done, to find out if he would have a spina bifida, to find out if he would have other debilitating diseases or conditions, to find, um, to schedule surgery. Every week we drove to Philadelphia, every week, every week, to try to keep this kid alive and do whatever we could to give him the best life possible if he was, when he was born. Christian was born on June 20th, 1993. Three days later, he had surgery. We installed the shunt. Three months later, we were back in surgery with Christian because his brain had grown back to such an extent that it clogged, the gray matter clogged the shunt because there's little holes in the shunt to drain the fluid. And his brain had grown back to the point where um, he was perfect. Um, we were told that he, if he could see, he would only be able to see half of a book. And he wouldn't know where the start of the book was. So he would only be able to see the right side of the pages of the book. And uh, he could read books perfectly. And when we said to Dr. Shute, why is that the case? He said, because his brain was never told where he was supposed to see. So the portion of the brain that never formed was for his eyesight, never grew back but he could see perfectly. And that was because his brain picked up and learned somewhere else that his eyes needed to see. You only use 4% of your brain anyway, did you know that? It's amazing what you learn when you have a, son with, when you have a child with a disability or a potential disability. You study that so much that you become an expert. You study that condition and what happens with that condition so much you become an expert. It's just because of the love you have and your desire to make sure that person survives. <clears throat> I actually kid my kids all the time. I keep saying, you know what? I'm gonna go back to med school, screw it. I'm gonna go to med school. Cause I'm gonna, just because I'm gonna show these doctors that you know some 59 year old guy with a law degree can also go to med school. So screw it, I'm gonna go to med school. And they, my kids always laugh at me because I don't like the sight of blood. <laughs> that's really why they laugh at me because they know that's, I'm not gonna do very really well in med school because I don't like the sight of blood. <clears throat> So we had Christian, and uh, he was perfect. He ran, played, huge Penn State fan, huge Baltimore Oriole fan. Um, we would play baseball, and he was Cal Ripken Jr. All nine positions, he was Cal Ripken Jr., man. He played, Cal, Cal Ripken in our house was the true Iron Man of baseball, let me tell you. For Christian, to, so he was running around, he playing, and uh, he had a shunt malfunction at the age of four, and we didn't get him to surgery in time, and his brain swelled and it closed the last remaining ventricle he had in his neck and shut the blood supply and oxygen. This always gets hard, babe. And he passed away on August 8th, my brother's birthday in uh, 1997. <coughs> Excuse me, there's a lot of anger. 
a lot of anger, a lot of anger at God. I moved away from my faith. How could bad things happen to good people? You know, you ever hear that question? I asked the question quite a bit. But I vowed that I would not let this adversity keep me angry, and I wouldn't let it keep me down. And I wouldn't let it tarnish the memory of Christian. So we went about using this adversity to benefit others. And I think on this campus, there's a classroom named after Christian somewhere. I think it might be in the business school, but there's a classroom here named after Christian. His school has a computer lab. The school he attended had a, has a computer lab named after Christian. We've raised over a million dollars for his school in 20 years to help students attend school and also provide technology for the students. Each one of the students has an iPad or a laptop computer from the fourth grade up through eighth grade. And we're going to keep spending it down, sending it down to the second and first graders. But each one of them gets, an, gets a computer that they use year round. And we, we update them every two years for his school. Um, we, he has touched over 7,000 individual students going through that school with what he is able to contribute in scholarship money and in improvements. We do an annual fundraiser for him. It's held at the Hilton. It's every Valentine's weekend, how more timely. We get over 400 people attending that event every year, black tie. When I ran for office, I gave away $10,000 each year, $1,000 scholarships to the students living in my legislative district in memory of Christian. <clears throat> we called it the Christian McNaughton Dollars for Scholars. So we help kids go to school. Now, I could have done nothing with it. I could have done nothing with it. I could have remained angry. I could have remained mad. Or I could use it to change my lifestyle, change what I do, help others succeed. And that's what we do in Christian's memory. I have so much to say in so little time. How much time do I have? I'm almost done. How much time do I have? Do you know? 12 minutes. Thank you. OK. So <clears throat> let's go back into, uh, into my business now. So I, you heard I was a legislator. Now I'm a builder. And uh, I like to tell people I build dreams. That's what I build. I don't build houses. I build dreams. Because when you come to me, you have a dream. And my goal is to help you get your dream fulfilled. And I don't care what walk of life you are, OK? It's not because the government tells me I'm not allowed to discriminate, and I'm not allowed to be impartial, and I'm not allowed to do things. It's because it's the right thing to do. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. It's easy. Life's easy if you do the right thing. But uh, so I build houses. I build dreams for people. and. Um, what I've learned and what you have to learn when you build houses or what you do in business is you need to know what your clientele wants. You need to know who they are and you need to understand what they're looking for. Because sometimes they don't tell you. So a lot of my clients are from the Indian community. Um, they say they're from India and they have a different religion and you need to know that if you want to be successful in working with them. You just need to know what they need. They need prayer rooms. Some of my clients need to make sure the stairs don't come to, towards the front door because their belief is that their money will roll out the front door when they open the front door. So they don't want the money rolling out the house. So you can't have their stairs come down to the front of that. It's crazy, isn't it? But you can't have their stairs coming down to the front door. Their stairs have to come down to the side. So you have to design your house so that the stairs come down into a foyer sideways. Um, some of my people, uh, the house cannot face a certain direction. So if it faces north, it's no good. If it faces south, it's okay. If it faces southeast, it's okay. If it faces southwest, uh, that's questionable. We got to get the, we got to get our priest out to take a look and see it. They actually come out with a compass and they'll stand on the lot and they'll look and go, yeah, well, that's not far enough southwest to be a problem, but, but, but this is. So they, they might not be able to build their house on the, on the home site or orient it properly so that they're allowed to build it. Um, some of my clients 
must do religious ceremonies before, during, and or after the house is built, but before they're allowed to move in. So you have to make accommodations for them. You have to be flexible. Uh -huh. You see, all these things you really need to do, and you never realize it, but you learn this as you go through your life. And uh, if I can tell you anything, you know, you need to be tolerant. That's one of the other ones I would tell you. Because you want to be, you want to be in politics, you want to be in business, and you want to be intolerant, you're going to fail miserably. And you need to learn patience. This is the one my wife tells me I need to learn all the time. I am not a patient person. Look at her, she's shaking her head. You can look at her, she's shaking her head. I am not a patient person. I have zero patience. I have zero tolerance. <clears throat> I have zero tolerance. And I was a politician, and now I'm a builder, and I need to do both. Uh, you know, tolerance and patience is critical, especially when somebody's in your face screaming at how horrible you are as an individual because you voted against a certain piece of legislation. <clears throat> how true people, tolerance uh, to the point where people will say really nasty things to your children, and they think they can because they think that's okay. And you, and you have to tell them in a nice way that, you know, maybe the kids should be off limits from the discussion. Okay, now sometimes some people don't listen. So I think I'm, everybody tells me I'm a big guy. I don't know. Like, I, everybody tells me I'm a big guy. So sometimes the big guy comes out and has to tell them that in a little different tone, maybe, maybe a little different manner, uh, that the kids are off limits. <clears throat> My children heard horrendous things uh, when they're growing up. So, uh, but you need to be tolerant, you need to be patient. Two things I have to work on all the time. I pray for tolerance. I pray for patience every morning. I start the day on a bended knee, and I read a Bible verse, and I ask for patience and tolerance every day. That hasn't worked, right, babe? So I, I keep it going because it hasn't worked. It hasn't quite worked yet. So, okay, so I keep it going uh, because I think that's really important. I think you need to believe in something strongly. I believe in my faith. I believe I'm going to see Christian again. That's a big one, because if you only believe that this is the best it's going to get, I would suggest to you that you might want to revisit that thought. As this, this is the best it's going to get for you, and you look around and you see what's happening in this world, that's not where you want to remain, I don't think. I want to go to a place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, and have eternal life and see my son and play with him again. It's been 26, 26 years, right? 26 years it'll be this year um, since I've played with Christian. I want to do that again. So hopefully, I'm going to wrap you up. If you have any questions for me, you can ask. Uh, my life's pretty much an open book. If you want to read about it, go on Wikipedia. There's a Wikipedia page about me. It was started... Unfortunately, during my divorce to my first wife, they started the Wikipedia page. And uh, you can, once you have a Wikipedia page, by the way, you cannot take it down. I, did you know that? I didn't know that. You can't take a Wikipedia page down. So I can't eliminate all this bad crap that's out there about me. So I go in and edit it from time to time. If somebody wants to add something that's bad, you can go back in and edit their comments. So from time to time, I haven't looked at it for a few years, not uh, since I've been out of office. I haven't looked at my Wikipedia page as often as I used to. But yeah, I have a Wikipedia page. You can read about me. <clears throat> you might remember this one too. Not everything you read about a person is true. Okay? Especially on you guys' social media sites. Everything you read on the internet is not true. I know it might come as a surprise, but it's not true. <laughs> okay? So I thank you very much, Elizabethtown College, for having me here. I really appreciate you guys allowing me to come down here and speak. Hopefully you gleaned something from what I had to say about my professional and personal life that might be able to help you in your professional and personal lives. Um, so uh, if you need me, um, my email address uh, at work is mcnaughton at mcnaughtonhomes.com if you want to talk to me. Uh, my phone number is all over every toilet seat probably and known to man. It's in every bathroom. I, I tell people, you know, want my number, it's easy. My number is 717-503-9111. That's my phone number. I've had the number 9111 since my kids were children, little, because every time they call me, it's a doggone emergency. I mean, 
Dad, I need 10 bucks. Dad, I need 20 bucks. That's our idea of an emergency. <clears throat> but uh, no, that's my, cell, that's my number if you want to reach me. And uh, if you have any questions for me, I'll, I'll entertain them at this time. So thanks, guys. <laughs> Nothing? Wow. I was either really good or really bad. I don't know which one it was. Yes. Oh, students who don't know what's next. Well, the problem with that question is sometimes it's not what you don't know, it's what you don't know you don't know. That's the problem. Um, so th I would suggest that they try and take any opportunity that comes to them. I would seize upon any opportunity that presents itself because the, it may not be in your in, my, in your profession. I mean, you may find that your opportunities are not necessarily in the profession or the career you have chosen from college. I mean, I got my degree in finance and management. I, you know how much finance I used in the legislature? Very little, because those guys don't know how to manage money at all. They know how to spend it. Um, and in my business as a builder, um, I don't use a whole lot of finance. Um, I mean, financing for the bank, that's not finance like you get when you come here. Uh, but I do use management. So I use my management skills all the time when I was here. But you might find it not in the profession you think it's in. And I would take every opportunity to try a new profession if it presents itself and it's something you believe in. I would not, the other advice I would give you is I would not take a position just because I'm taking a position. And if you don't like the job you're being offered, if you don't want to do that, you don't have to do that, okay? There's nothing that'll make you more miserable in your professional and personal life than having a job that you do not like. It'll ruin your relationships, both personally and professionally. And if, you're in, if you ever see yourself in a position like that, you might wanna reevaluate what you're doing uh, because you don't wanna do something you don't love. You got a lot of years. I'm 59. I'm on the downside of the bell curve. You guys are on the upside of the bell curve. You got a lot of years to, to do this. You know, I'm going to work another 10 years, I think. Uh, but you guys have a lot of years ahead of you. You don't want them to be miserable. That would be my advice if I was a grad for a graduating senior here. Okay. The other one is don't let your book learning interfere with your education, guys. That's the other piece of advice I'll give you. Don't let your book learning interfere with your education. A lot of it occurs outside of those books. In fact, the most important probably does. All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. If you need me, let me know. Thank you.